Hello, hello. I'm Mr. Jared Scott, the aesthetic editor of Minnesota Monthly and Midwest Home. I'm excited to do yesterday's at the Maker's Table today and have John join me and talk all things Easter eggs and Polish folk art and uh, wonderful things. I am brought today to you by iBob's Bold Readers Blue Light and Prescription Eyewear that helps you make seven statements a week. I've got my iBob's on. John is joining here, so let's bring him in and we will get this conversation started. Requests. We had a little hiccup yesterday, but we have had dress rehearsals and all is well uh, today in Instagram world. There you are, my friend. <laughs> wow, pretty cool. You can hear me and I can hear you. So how are you today? Much better, thank you. Much better, thank you. Good, so good. yesterday, I felt really bad that we couldn't connect and I couldn't play my April Fool's joke. So today, I dressed up in my costume for you today. I love it. I love it. I love that feather in your hat. I think we should all have feathers in our hat on Fridays. <laughs> there you go. It's an eagle's feather from Poland that they, uh, every Gural, the mountaineer men, put in their hats. Nice. And also, I need to tell you, you inspired me last week. How's I, that? Uh, well, okay, I saw you drinking, not out of your mug. I don't think it was your mug, but you must have been drinking out of a paper cup. Your Maybe, child. yeah. Yeah. All right. And it got me to thinking, it is Easter time. So much goes to waste. And why don't I turn that into a project? So I did. And I cut it. And that up. Whoa. An Easter basket. You out of a paper cup. Look at that. With a handle. And because we couldn't connect yesterday, yeah. I had to quiet my creative soul. I didn't make one. I made five. Sure. I might turn pick one up from you. <laughs> there you go. I thought, I have to make this now for our guests. But you inspired me and I thought, wow, so many things get trashed. And this is a, just such a cool idea yeah. to do with kids and so easy where you could do this with yarn. Yeah, paper, I love it. An old tissue, you know, uh, old t-shirt, cut it up, newspapers, yarn, anything, uh, pipe cleaners, weave that and make your own basket. Amazing. So there Amazing. you go. So thank you for inspiring me. Well, thank you for showing me that. I'd love to inspire. Um, all right, so let's get into the chat. We're going to talk how you learn to make, what folk art is, your career, show us some eggs and everything. But Minnesota Monthly is dedicated to the spirit of Minnesota. And I want to know how being in Minnesota kind of inspires and influences your work, both the commercial side and the creative side. All right. Wow. How much time do we have? <laughs> I know. I thought starting at 11, we could still be talking at one, but we'll be good. We'll be good. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, first of all, it's interesting because my my connection with Poland and everything, my parents came here after World War II on separate journeys. They were in German labor camps and they were through their own personal journeys, got to Minnesota. My dad and his parents through Red Cross and the whole family, my mother uh, and her side of the family through farmers in Lewiston, Minnesota, then to Winona, Minnesota. And both Winona and Minneapolis had a community of Polish people. Okay. All right. So everything around the Polish culture usually revolves around the traditions, the culture, the holidays, the church, the community. And so being in Minneapolis in Northeast, that's where my, my, my uh, father's side of the family immigrated. Uh, there's a Polish church and a school. Uh, Holy Cross in Northeast Minneapolis there on University and like uh, 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 13th Street. Okay. And so when I was a little boy, I thought the whole world was Polish and Catholic. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of naive, but everything around all our family, all our friends, they all spoke Polish. They ate Polish. They sang Polish. Everything was Polish. And 
it's and we did the traditions and the culture we spoke the language we wrote the language we read and there was eight kids in our family and we my dad taught us on sundays po uh the language we absolutely hated it because he wasn't a good teacher uh but my par my grandparents on both sides instilled the culture and the language and how important that was to keep and to foster. Yeah. And so I remember as a little boy going to my grandmother's house in Northeast Minneapolis. She lived kitty corner from the Polish church and everything was covered in plastic or doilies in the old Polish homes. And grandma didn't want you to touch anything. And there was a bunch of beautiful eggs behind glass that were just like magic. And they spoke to me and it's like, wow, every time I went there, I just gravitated towards those eggs. And that kind of started that journey mm -hmm. with that and my grandparents being very strong and really wanting to keep uh, the language, the culture alive. That is so important when you were, you know, especially when you're an immigrant and you want to keep that part of you alive. And so you want to bring the food back from the old country and the language and the arts and everything and recreate that here. And so um, that's what my grandparents did and my parents. And so that's kind of how I started by watching. And we didn't have internet and we didn't have magazines and all this. So everything was by watching and doing. And so, yes, you know, it was a slow process and you made mistakes, but you learn from that. And, you know, my whole journey has been, you know, because even like with the Easter eggs, okay, and the traditions, that was secret and no one shared that. And everybody had their own patterns and designs. And then there was different designs and patterns amongst the different even nationalities. Because not only do the Poles do the Pisanki, the Easter eggs, and we'll get into that, yeah. but then the Russians, the Ukrainians, the, the white Russians, Latvians, you know, uh, even Hungarians do their own type of eggs. And everything was a secret. And every village had their own patterns and own colors and also how to make your dyes, you know. And so, and also, it was mainly girls did that women and for come in and do this and break that kind of thing it was kind of interesting refreshing yeah. but by looking and asking and i did find very very gracious people but it was very difficult to be able to start this it took years let's pause there for a second so we got a little bit of of how this was passed down to you but let's talk about um this, i didn't know we'd go there so early but being a male creative was it just that yeah. grandmother and those people saw that that you had the interest and the talent yeah and how was that accepted and no you know what there was eight kids in our family i have one sister and seven brothers and so in a polish family they wanted you to be lawyers doctors priests you know, nuns. And here I wanted to be an artist. Yeah. And how can an artist make a, a living? So it was never fostered in me, even though I drew all the time and did things creatively. It wasn't until much later where my mother's grandparents uh, really fostered and saw that. And my, my one, uh, the one grandmother, but usually yeah, it was hard to break that, to do that and to teach that. And, and even when I went into high school and I'm taking art classes, because I went to a par parochial school, we didn't have all these resources. So going in there and all of a sudden, first of all, everyone's speaking a different language or it, not just Polish, but English and there's Swedes and there's Norwegians. That opened um, my, my eyes open going to a public high school, but also then ceramics, painting, all, sculpture, all this was available, weaving for me. And that just got me just going uh, creatively. And I've, and I've always had that in my soul, being creative. And I wanted to be an artist and go to art school and go to college, but it was never 
Um, it was looked down upon by others, especially the males in the family, because like I said, they wanted you to be a, a lawyer, a doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, how are you going to make a living as an artist? You're going to starve. So did you end up with a lawyer, or a priest, or a doctor, and your brothers at all? Nothing. Nobody. <laughs> uh, how's that? Yeah. <laughs> and here well, I went to art school, and then I went to Europe to learn, and uh, it's been an incredible journey. And I've been blessed by, you know, going into, you know, I, I lived in Europe, and I wanted to reconnect with my family. And I was supposed to go to Poland for a year. I got a scholarship. And one year turned to two years, two years turned to three, and it kept going. And I did everything at that time that I could stay in Europe. I sold my clothes, black market. I taught English classes. I picked grapes in Switzerland. I was so blessed. I hitchhiked all through Eastern, Western Europe, Scandinavia. It was an incredible journey. And then I returned. It was time to come back. And I came back kind of as the starving artist. And what do I do? Mm -hmm. my, my father said, oh, you could be a janitor at Honeywell. That's what he gave and said, you could live in Minneapolis. And I was like, no, I'm going to finish my art career. That's so I right. went back to Winona and finished my degree. And I came back to Minneapolis thinking, what could I do? And it was interesting because I started off, I don't know how long you've been here, but there uh, at St. Anthony, Maine, used to be the place to shop and be, be, be uh, kind of seen um, in those shops at St. Anthony, Maine. And I came upon Salisbury Flower Markets. And I, uh, they hired me on the spot. And I was their, gosh, designer, uh, everything uh, of their four different stores. And it was flowers by the stems. And at that time, you know, everything was nothing against Bachman's, but everything was little old lady, very tight arrangements. Everything was dyed. And I swore I would never do blue dyed daisies and carnations and all that. And I opened up an incredible treasure chest. I was doing things for the Art Institute, the Guthrie, the Walker, you know, Art and Bloom started with me and I'm doing the arrangements for all the ladies secretly. Why this is important is because it gave me kind of a background with my background of art and traveling and food and art and flowers. Yeah. Um, I was doing all these at that time arrangements for photo stylists and photographers in the advertising world. And they were giving me torn out sheet, uh, sheets from Dayton's and from all these other campaigns with my work. And they said, God, you should go into advertising. You'd be great as a stylist or a producer or whatever. And I had no idea. When we went to college, they didn't give us any kind of, you know, went through school and, you know, good luck, find a job, you know. Yeah. But people gave me this. I started putting together a portfolio. And I found out who the top 10 studios in town were. And I got hired on the spot by an incredible photographer, Jim Marvey at Marvey Advertising Photography, and his wife at that time, Barb Levy. And I had the most incredible career and broke off and then started, I'm not going to get into that, but we don't have time, but 38 years, I had a beautiful, brilliant, creative career in advertising. So I was producing and propping and styling and food styling. And I got to work with the most amazing people. And my art background helped me tremendously because I could weave a basket. I could draw, yeah. I could paint, I could do all the stuff. I scrounged, I begged, I borrowed, I stole anything for a photo shoot. And it was great because I got to do some incredible, incredible uh, campaigns. And if you, uh, you mentioned this in your ad, in, in kind of the uh, promo last year, if everybody remembers Caribou Coffee. Yeah. I got to work on that project. It was amazing. It was so incredible, hard, tedious, but incredible. All the paper cutting for Camp Caribou. And we got to work on the video and the posters and the in-store signage. And it was amazing. I had yeah. done. 
and I've been blessed with so many wonderful people in my life with propping and styling, uh, not only prop styling, but food styling. And also I have an, I, at, the, at that time, and I still do have a prop house. So making and doing and producing, it, it was an incredible career. Yeah. In the meantime, I, go ahead. No, go ahead, finish. And in the meantime, having a family and teaching, I was doing the Festival of Nations in costume like I am, doing and showing the Polish folk art, the uh, teaching and passing on to others. It is so important. You know what? It, it's in this day and age, so much is getting lost because of our young people are gravitating towards the computer, the electrical, electronics, and they want yeah. it and fast and easy. I want to say something to that because I think that, you know, as incredible a time as we're living in with improvements to everything, you know, at the end of the day, what's left is craft and handmade. I found a, an iPod or iPhone or something the other day. I didn't even know what charger plugged into it. And I thought, like, there's nothing to this, but I can pick up something handmade and it's got a story in it. You can feel it and you know that hands touch it and the heart touch it. And I think that's the beauty of any craft that honors the past, but still has relevance to whoever picks it up today or tomorrow or a hundred years from now. Exactly. I tell people, I still write with a fountain pen. Of course you do. <laughs> but use a computer because I have to. You know? Yeah, okay. I, okay. I struggle with the electronics, but then I can draw, I can weave, I can imagine. And you know what? I'm also back to teaching in the schools, and mm -hmm. I am teaching kids to get out of the box, to sit down, slow down, use your imagination. That's so important. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about folk art because you you know that I work with makers all over the world sure. and I really have been focused. I talked with Tokum uh, Stoneware down in Southern Minnesota and just talking to Lucy like really turned me on to not just what folk art is, but what's its place in the marketplace? What's its place in the creative community? When is it appropriation? When is it mass produced? When is it you know, all those things. And so I've struggled with, um, I think we've learned today from you, there's an intergenerational aspect to it. There's the older generation teaching the new generation. There's that idea of a master passing it on. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. And it's so important to find and connect with that. And that's so hard to find now. Yeah. A lot of those masters are older and dying and we're not getting support from the arts. It is so hard. You know, I have found, you know, there are centers for like bookmaking, yeah. for ceramics, glass blowers in town, but there's nothing for the folk artist. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. And is, what happened? Did, was there a generation skipped in there or was it just no interest from the current generation? Or how did that really happen where we skipped a generation of masters? I mean, there just wasn't that level do you agree with that kind of you know what the, those masters are there okay uh, older ones but they are dying but the young what i'm finding is first of all because i've been doing like the festival of nations for 38 years and there's so many young kids there and they are coming and it's interesting it's not only little, uh, little girls but also boys coming and wanting to learn and sit down and when they sit down what happens is I think with the electronics and they're so bombarded with so much today yeah. to yourself, sit down, recon disconnect yourself from the world and make yourself do something. I've had kids sit down with me at the Festival of Nations and they have held the school bus back or so that they could finish their egg. And they're not there for 15 minutes. They're working with me for two, three hours. And when they see what they can do and produce, that there is not a no, you yeah. can do this. Yeah. But you cannot, everybody wants to be a master and it takes years to develop this skill. It does. I think also, you know, because meaning changes so often over time, right. relevance, different ages, different cultures, 
but I think that there's something about there's a duty, I guess, to really breathe life into that craft. Yes. And you know, I um I have a habit of keeping way too many things because like you, I've had a great career, but I also get the joy of going and learning how to make things side by side with somebody. And I can pick something up and remember standing in the studio or the market that I bought it at it, just that power of the story and the power of the handmade because there's breath in it. There's true breath in it. I totally agree with you. With my career in advertising, I have met so many makers, so many people I've been invited into their houses and I have seen, I have listened, or even when I've traveled, I, as you can tell, I've got the gift of gab and I travel differently and my kids are like, okay, dad, I'm in the kitchen cooking with them. I'm weaving baskets. Anywhere I go, I connect with them and I look for something different. It, it's kind of cool. I do see the, you know, the, the tourist things, but then I'm wanting to meet the real people. Yeah. The real people, the real food, the real soul. And, and the amazing thing too is like, we can take advantage of that and the intergenerational thing right here without ever having to travel. And I think that's what people forget. Like I learned how to make, um, I worked with the sisterhood of Temple Israel a few sure. years ago. And I learned how to make matzo ball soup from a 106-year-old, that Grandma Ruth. And I, I think she's still with us. I think she must be 110 now. But I mean, like looking at her hands and thinking like how many matzo balls she's made in 110 years. And I think just that power of, um, it's a level of respect. I think, first of all, you have to respect the tradition, but really the willingness to learn. And I think that so often you said like whether you're a boy that shouldn't be creative or don't have the time or think you need to be focused on something else when you allow yourself to do that um that thing that makes your heart or your soul happy yep your whole world is better the whole world is better i agree you know what i have to tell you this amazing story you talking about the matzo ball thing yeah i told myself and kind of like you when you see something, I can't start another new project. I can't do this. I'm already doing so much, but it grabs you. I remember, I have to tell you this, a number of years ago, I went to the Art of World in Northeast. Yeah. And stopped in Northeast at St. Mary's Russian Orthodox Church. And they were doing iconography demonstrations. And I was so enamored, it's like, oh God, I can't do this. I can't learn another thing. But it just hooked me, and I'm still doing that. And I know just, you are. Yes, for 14 years now. That's how my iconography journey. And you know what? You were talking about the older ladies and learning from them. I, there's this wonderful sister who's 80, in her 80s. And I learned how to make handmade shell gold like they used to do, you know, in the Renaissance time. Yeah. When, when you had an apprentice and you're making and you're tapping and yes, it takes an hour and a half to tap that gold with the honey and you're doing it. But it is amazing what you come out of this, what you learn and doing it the old world. And even like, go ahead. I just want to say that's the point of it because even going through that process and that technique at the end of it, you can't tell if it was made an hour ago or a hundred years ago. Because you no. respect the tradition, yeah. Well, everyone comes up and says to me, how long did it take you to make that egg? And it's like, how old am I? It's not just that, it's all the time, the experience, the failures, the, you know, the, uh, every, not only failures, but also all the uh, great things that come out and, and just the learning and demonstrating where you've been and showing. It's everything. It's not just an hour or two. It's 60 some years. Yeah. And I think, you know, I focus a lot with my makers and my clients about this idea that there is something sacred to what we create, that it is a tribute and it is an offering of our skills and perhaps the powers above. 
you know, there's something that moves in you and through you when you create. So you may think you may have been working on something 10 minutes and it could have been two hours because there is that loss of time and that, that loss of space. Um, I have to just say quickly, we have someone that's joined us from Scotland, someone who says how amazing you are and they want to see YouTube videos of you. This video will be up on Minnesota Monthly uh, later today, but uh, let's just keep going. Um, do you I want to say, throw some eggs? I do, but I want to say, um, I want to go back to icons because sure. I studied theater uh, in Russia. At one point, I was going to be an actor, then I was going to be a dramaturg. And so I went to Russia to study Chekhov. And that was the first time that I saw icons. And I remember, I don't know if I stood there for two minutes or two hours, because those eyes, there's something, you know, they say in Orthodox that it's, it's the windows to the, to the other world. Yeah. And so I then married a Greek Orthodox, good guy. Um, who also I was surrounded with those same eyes and that same feeling. And there's such a, a reverence to seeing them. And when you know the, the tradition of painting them, but they really are just like nothing else in the world. You got it. Wow. You just spoke to me. You know, I remember seeing my first icon and it was in Russia, but at that time, that was when I was living in Poland and um, it was kind of, I, I, I was on an exchange program to Russia and they were burning icons and it wasn't, you know, you could only see it in some of the, the museums. And I stood in front of Rublos Trinity. And at that time, I really didn't know what I was seeing. Yeah. It took me, and then I came back to America, wrote a paper on icons and I got an A plus in art history and the professor said, you should be an art historian. And I pulled out that paper and I was like, what a fool. I read what I wrote. I had no idea what I was truly reading and seeing until I picked up this connection with the icons. And then in 2016, I went back to Russia and saw that Rublo and I was like, this is what it's all about. That was, yeah. awesome. like you said, and being in that holy presence and learning the whole thing. Because, you know, an icon, it's not just an art piece. It's a holy image. Yes. And you have to meditate and prayer. And there's so much contemplation that goes into it. You can't just sit and just paint because you want to paint. You have to be in a certain mind frame. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take a day. I have icons that took me a year, two years to get done. And I, now. I remember we, I was accompanied by a, a translator and wore the thing in my ear. And I remember saying to her, I think we were at, you know, all those churches had those names, like the Church of Spilled Blood or whatever they translate to it. Right. I remember saying to her, so is this a relic? And she was almost offended. And she said, no, it's a lie. Right. Like it's not like I understand what a religious relic is, but there's something alive about those icons. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And just the process. And I'm working with the Prosophone School of Iconology and okay. for 14 years. And it's such an incredible journey. Not only I, people say, oh, you should teach, you should teach. No, I am a student. I have so much to see so much to learn so it's incredible the whole process right now i'm actually doing a short video on i'm doing the black madonna of Częstochowa from poland okay and that's a whole nother story and journey and my son came to me and said dad i want to photograph step by step a video so people realize they have no idea what it takes to to write a icon uh, and what each step means. He thought I, you know, it's going to be two, three, you know, video things. It's a whole process. It's 20 yeah. some steps in order to do one. And just plus the prayer and the contemplation and, and everything. It's amazing from the grind. You know what? For, for doing a true icon, there's a lot of icons out there. And a lot of people are doing them, but not in the true old fashioned Byzantine style. 
where our pigments are actually rocks, minerals that we are crushing to make the real color like the apprentices did in the old days and mixing it with an egg emulsion and wine and then making our color and the gold gilding and shining the clay bowl with a wolf's tooth and, and just everything and etching it into the board and what everything means from the Kopchev, the Ark of the Covenant to the white and getting it from the dark to the light and the brilliance of the, and the holy presence of an icon. It's incredible. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, let's see some eggs, my friend. All right. Let's see. I'm going to just throw you through just a quick, first of all, process of what it is. Yeah. Okay. Please. So you take a plain egg and you have a tool. Can you see this? Yep. It's called a pisak. It comes from the Polish word pisach to write. And what it is, is a wooden stick with a funnel that is hollow. Whoops. See that hole there? Yeah. You fill that with beeswax. There's my beeswax. You put that into the hole. You light that under a, uh, a candle flame. I do according to the old world, the old traditions. There's many people using electric socks or the kiss cause I'm sorry I'm glad people are doing it but they're making it a science and not an art and they're and they're pre-planning all their designs with pencils and all these templates and it's like I'm glad they're doing it and they're doing pisanki but all my pisanki there is not a pencil there's maybe two lines I do a horizontal and a vertical line when I start in pencil and then it's whatever comes out of my hand. Yeah. No eggs are pre-planned at all. It's whatever comes out of my hand. So it's a batik process going from light to dark. So whatever I'm covering right now, this is a brown egg, will be brown. And then you go from light to dark colors. And I have natural dyes and also organic dyes. So you go from light to dark and your egg at the end is all black because it's, it's a batik process. Then I'm going to turn the egg around. I did this purposely. Yeah. You see the pattern come through. You yeah. melt the wax off under the, uh, the light of the candle and you melt and your pattern comes through beautifully, the magic. And so in the pisanka, all the patterns, all the colors mean something in the Pisanka. You know, our ancestors uh, get started, and I, when I do this, I, it, I teach it kind of, uh, because it was a, uh, our, our ancestors were peasants. They lived outside, they farmed, they lived by the nature. So a lot of these had pagan symbols. And then when Poland accepted Christianity in 966, they adapted the pagan symbols to Christian symbols. So I teach what all the symbols mean. And I'm just going to go really quickly here. Yeah. You see the egg divided in three. That's okay. for the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or Mother, Father, Child, or the new moon, the old moon, and the full moon. You see the star. That was the symbol for the ancient symbol of the pagan sun god, or it's for Jesus Christ. You see the little dots. That is for rain, seeds, or when Christ was crucified, Mary cried, and her tears went on the pisanka. You see the triangle for wind, water, and air, or Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You see that there's a band going all the way around the egg. You see that? For eternity. Mm -hmm. Here you have another sun god. But you also have in that sun god, you see um, uh, what, what, uh, the uh, pine needles. That's for youth. That's for youthfulness. So everything means something. White. And I'm sure there's more. I, oh, the little uh, like teeth mark. That's wolf's teeth for protection. White is a symbol for purity. Red is the most holiest color 
on a pisanka. And that's for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the blood. And it's for life. Black to ward off evil and bad spirits. So every pisanka has a meaning. And when you pick it or purchase it, I tell you what it means. Because it's like your fortune. You're drawn to it. It's a talisman. So this is a batik egg. And they're either, in the olden days, they were full. Because the egg was a symbol of life. And you didn't tamper with the insides. But with traveling and sending, uh, they break. So uh, I have both. I have where you blow them out, you'll see a hole. Here's a hole at the end. Yeah. And I blew out the contents. And then you would shellac them. So this is a batik process going from light to dark. That is only one type. Another type of batik egg in Poland, this is called the drop pull batik process that is made with the end of a pin it's a drop pull drop pull pattern and in the polish tradition you melt off the wax there are other like the slovenians okay the Bulls, uh the czechs they leave the pin drops and they're usually colored wax same technique then this is interesting because it's a brown egg and I've done it. You can see there's like three different colors. Yeah. Uh, what I do is instead of adding color, I put it in. Now get this, everybody. I'm taking off with sauerkraut juice. It eats it away. So it's a dark brown egg. So whatever I want, dark brown, I fill that in with wax. Then I put it into sauerkraut juice and I watch it and it goes to the medium brown. And then fill, fill that with wax, put it again in the sauerkraut juice, put it in the light, and then get it to the white. Then I melt all my pattern off. I mean, the uh, wax off, I'm sorry. Yeah. And the comes through. So this is, you're taking off. And it depends on whose sauerkraut juice. I have my mother's sauerkraut juice, my, gra my, mother, my uh, godmother's and my wife's, and each one does differently. My okay. Two questions. Sure. And then we'll keep going. One, when you're working on it, yes. do you know when it's done? Does something say to you, I'm done? Yes, I feel it. And when you get everything washed off, do you still have that moment of, damn, I made that? Yes. You feel this sense of satisfaction, this, like it's feeding your soul. It is so incredible and amazing. And yes. there's that flip between damn, I made that, that you know you made it, but there's also that, where did that come from? Do you yes. have that moment? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. And that I got to keep doing this. You know what? When I'm not doing this, I feel anxious and that there's a big void in my life. Yeah. Well, tell me, how do you find peace in your life? By doing this, these, all this artwork from the icons to the pisanki to the chandeliers, the ornaments, Drawing, painting, weaving, gardening, cooking. Everything in our house is handmade. It really is. Everything is homemade, handmade, organic, I rem fresh. I remember it's been, um, I don't even know, two or three years since we've actually sat down for coffee. And yeah. I remember I think your daughter was getting married and you yeah. were redoing a kitchen. And you were just describing your cooking process. And I thought like, oh my gosh, she's churning out these great meals. What were you doing? Like a hot plate or something? And Oh, gosh, yes. Our, that's right. Oh, God. We had nothing, nothing in our kitchen. Yeah. Because we're renovating, and I had to do a cook a whole meal on a hot plate, and I did it. We don't yeah. buy instant food, and people are amazed. I posted some things on Instagram, I remember, and they you did that on a hot plate? Of course I did. Or, you know, I will do things where uh, uh, a while back, like about a month ago, I wanted to bake bread. And I told myself, I am not going to use any electrical appliances. I made everything by hand. I did. It was incredible. And the smell, the scent. I made a gorgeous challah bread that I braided. And the dill was from my garden. And the sesame seeds from the Polish, um, I didn't use sesame, poppy seeds from the Polish store. It was phenomenal. The eggs were from the Amish. We go to the Amish, we get our eggs. We get, I bring back manure. 
uh, I bring everything back from them, potatoes, yeah. and onions, and beets. And I use, we use every part of the, the animal. So did your kids growing up, you know, I'm sure it was a different experience because you weren't surrounded by the whole Polish community. Right. But do they still have a sense of how special and magical that upbringing was? Or did they think like, oh, there goes dad again? Okay, that's interesting. All their friends came here and thought our house was exotic and loved coming here because they got real food. And even the neighbors, because we had for the first, when you live in a Polish family, you don't just live with yourselves. My mother-in-law lived with us for 10 years for the first 10 years. And so she took care of all the kids in the neighborhood and they came to our house. So they had real soup, not from, you know, or Chef Boyardee from the can. She yeah. made soup from scratch. People, my, fr my kids' friends loved coming here for, because it's like, what, what's she making for dinner? Or what are we having for dinner? My kids would bring lunch to school and the teachers would want to trade with my kids. They, but my kids didn't know what a peanut butter jelly sandwich was or Wonder Bread. And they would trade for the Cheetos or because they didn't know that. They didn't have that. That was exotic to them. Yes, you got it. Um, all right, back to show and tell. You got anything else there to show us? Do you oh, have an icon couple. you could show us? Yes. This is another type of egg. Wow. This is called Vichyninki. I was taught how to make these eggs. These, these are not stencils. They're all cut out of sheep shears and special paper from Poland that I learned from a older woman in the Kurpia region in Poland. These are from Wowicz. Then the next type of egg. I had, um, if you look on today's post that I put on, I put on some straw eggs. I put on stuff because I felt bad that we couldn't connect. But this is an egg that I did. This isn't a colored one, but a white goose egg. And this is straw. It's a whole process. There are 277 pieces of straw. No pencil marks that I put on, glued on, and a whole. So these are made out of straw, another part from Poland. And you'll see colored ones on my post. Uh, another type. Uh, this is an etched egg. This is made out of uh, goose egg, dyed in onion skins that I did last year. So I did Christ being crucified. And uh, let's see if I can show you this. These eggs here, you see that? So let me see. No, you can flip your camera to right. Um, Kind of, there should be the arrows going in a circle. Oh, is that? Oh, got it. Oh, there okay. we go. Perfect. So here's some eggs. Whoa. Those are natural dyes, and those are etched or scratched. Excuse me. That is another process. Here is, I did not do this one. This is in my collection. My mother-in-law gave me this. This is an ostrich egg that has been all scratched and all four sides are different on the egg. Then here are some more eggs right here. Here is, I have never broken an egg. People have, and I decided to make my own folk art and I've made three dimensional eggs out. Of, so this is actually a egg shape that is styrofoam covered in bamboo and then all these broken pieces that I did not want to throw away because it is hundreds of hours of work. Yeah. And there are scratched eggs, petite eggs, and I made my own egg. Look and I've that. done collages this way. Um, there is another type. Uh, I wanted to show you this. Okay, John, focus. I'll put it here. So, that's another goose egg in the wow. batik style. Here is a emu egg. Sorry, everyone. I've seen those when we at Eusebio West down those emu eggs. Right, and the and this is etched in sauerkraut juice. Because the emu Did you know egg there's it's totally random. Did you know there's an emu farm in Wisconsin? No. no. Yeah. 
I need yeah, to find yeah. out where because it's hard to get that. Wow. I'll, I'll hook you up with her. She sells emu oil and makes some soap products and stuff that has like hundreds of emu that roam in Wisconsin. Wow. And then in Poland, there are different other eggs that I haven't even shown. There's painted eggs, wooden eggs. There are eggs that are beautifully, beautifully um, bulrush. It's a special uh, like white pith that's out of a stem, out of a, a grass that grows in the marshlands. And they apply that on the eggs. It's stunning. I have some of those. I don't have them up here. Otherwise, I'd show you. Yeah. There's so many, and there's embroidered eggs they're doing now, felted eggs. Uh, oh, in the prisons in Poland, the men are taking chains and weaving them and putting them on the eggs. I've got like eight of them. They're wow. stunning. Post one of those. I'd be interested in seeing that. Yeah. And there's wooden eggs from this costume that I'm wearing. The yeah. Mon They take their axe and they chop on the egg and they make these incredible wooden eggs with, you know, uh, um, chipped out or sculpted out designs. They're beautiful. Painted eggs. So they, so not only do, you know, everyone knows Ukrainian Easter eggs because they've been really promoted, but there's so many cultures, so many traditions that do the eggs. But in Poland, we have the two different types of batik. We have the scratched, we have the etched, we have the straw, straw. we have the paper, we have the bulrush. Uh, I also started doing jewelry, cutting out goose eggs, doing them like the batik eggs and cutting them. That takes a learning curve. Yeah. And, that, and I've been doing ornaments and birds. And the most incredible thing that I haven't shown yet, I've been making Christmas tree toppers out of eggs. I call them a goose duckin. Let's see why. I use a goose, a duck, and a chicken egg. <laughs> so it's a goose duckin, and it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Do you have one there? Uh, no, it's upstairs, unfortunately. I do have it on my Instagram account if someone okay. wants to go and look, or I can post one later. Yeah, post the chain one, post that. Um, do you have any of that paper that you do, like the paper... What is the significance of that kind of the starburst? Oh, those. Yeah, what, what is that? Okay. In the Polish villages, nothing ever got wasted. Okay. When you cooked. You well, you made a basket out of a coffee cup, so clearly nothing ever gets wasted. <laughs> you got it. So when you cook, you save the eggs. You have yarn. You have tissue paper. When they bought a dress or shoes, they were wrapped in tissue paper. They saved all that straw, hemp, seeds. And they made these incredible, elaborate chandeliers. There are no books how to make this. They have been passed on. And there's different regions in Poland that make this. So I, when I was living there, I was enamored by them. But I, there, how to make them, I didn't know how I came back, wanted to do it. And I struggled and learned. So what I've been doing as I've been making these uh, chandeliers. I've been documenting them, photographing them, writing the instructions. So someday maybe I'd like to do a book or a pamphlet, or I'd really like to do an uh, art show yeah. with 13 and I'm on number nine. But wow. making these elaborate chandeliers, you made them at Christmas time or at Easter. And what it is, is uh, Makosha was the goddess of the harp. And a pająk in Polish means spider web. So okay. Makosha, you hung these over your dining room table and it protected the family. So you, it is still going on in the villages of Poland. It is coming alive even more. Uh, and they're just stunning. If you see the different types of, um, I can show you one up here. Uh, let's see. I can show you an ornament. This is just one part of it. Yeah. That has 25 layers times eight points. That's 200 points per ornament. That is all made out of tissue paper. And that's one of the beginning parts of a pionk. Splendid, splendid. Tell me what advice you have for makers, people that just know that they're itching to make something. You guys, use your mouth and use your hands. 
use your creativity, go out there. There's so much to see, do, learn. And before it's all gone, spread it, learn it. The traditions, you know, really just don't be afraid. Use your mouth. Don't be afraid to talk, ask, you, you know, that's the thing. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Just make it, do it. And you'll see how much God in peace and beauty it brings into your life. That homemade, handmade thing. What is the best part about working with your hands? They never get tired. My, it's funny. My son-in-law comes over. He calls me Geppetto. I can see that. I'm sitting here. I'm always doing something. Not that I have to, but I'm just, there is that inner need of my hand that I'm doing, creating. Uh, it's beautiful. It's, I, it, it, like I said, it's, it's something that really is down and deep. And I feel that I'm honoring my ancestors, my family, my roots. It's a deep connection. And the coolest thing for me was when I went back to Poland, I was in a juried art show in Poland, a folk art show. The, this is the second largest folk show in Europe. It's in Lublin, Poland. It's juried. I got accepted. And I made the full circle around. I, coming from America, was going to Poland to po show them Polish folk art, my Polish folk art. And people were like, that is going on in the U.S., in Minneapolis. I guess in Minnesota, yep. yep yes, yep. yes. And they're looking at my eggs, because I also do painting on glass. It's called Malavanya na Szkle. So I do that also. And I brought icons and the eggs, and people were like, wow. Even the people that were doing the eggs in Poland that I connected, the folk artists, they were like, this is so cool. And it was such a empowering thing for me to make that big circle, to go back and show them and do it. So I always like to ask about kind of if you could share a meal or if you could this or that. But I think for you, like if you could just be in the presence of someone and share your craft with them one-on-one, yep. -on -one, who would you choose? Which craft? I think the eggs. The eggs? Wow. There is a little old lady and also a gentleman outside of Lublin, Poland, who make the most incredible eggs. And they are the traditional old patterns. It's not the dyspora, the new. It's the old designs where they know what those meanings what those colors mean. And they're very primitive to us, but we're losing that. Everybody wants to do poppies and wheat and beautiful modern things and their interpretations. And I'm seeing dinosaurs on eggs and everything. Yeah. But old world, the, the, because you know we have to remember those signs, those symbols, those colors had a meaning. And it was for fertility, for protection, for growth, for all the stuff. And they really believed in that and were losing all that. And, you know, with us being handmade, uh, homemade, I think people are wanting to find the real source of a, a art form. Um, and there's so much information, but there's also some very bad information and very bad um, instructions. There really is, because even when I'm doing the Polish stuff and I'm seeing what's out there, it's like, wow, they're doing it fast, easy, and cheap. Yeah. Well, I think part of it, too, goes back to just that, the true tools of the trade. I mean, whether you're talking leather craft or woodworking or anything, one, you know, if you do it without electricity, you're honoring the past. Um, right. But really, that sense of, of the time that it takes, the dedication that it takes. Oh, yes. Uh, you can't hurry that process. And no. respect it at the same time. I think that's part of the thing um, with folk art. Now, do you feel like, now we may be treading into deep waters here, let's see. Sure. Do you feel like non-Polish people can do the eggs? 
do you feel that if it's done with love and respect? You know what? Yes, anyone can do that. And I think it's important to see pass on. But what I see the difference is, I don't think folk art is being respected. I think fine arts, because everyone's so used to Picasso and Van Gogh, and you have to be educated or you have to be in the fine arts to be an artist. They don't understand what a true folk artist is. Those things are coming out of his hands, out of his feet, out of his soul, his heart, his life. You know, it's like it's being born out of the soil, out of his hands. And it's, they see it as being quirky or naive, and it's not at all. There's so much more to that story. Because even going in and trying to sell my things in an art gallery, and people do say, they make a distinction between fine arts and folk art. And craft. And, and craft, yes. Uh -huh. And that's the hard thing, I think, how to re-educate people about what it is, what it takes to do, how to think about things. Uh, yeah. But I, I do see a huge interest in it. But it's how to, my, my hard thing is how to get out there to the people, yeah. to the right places, to the right galleries. Because when people see this, I'm amazed. A lot of art curators come to me, art buyers, true art buyers. I'm talking about people with some money. Uh, they see the experience. It's interesting. They see what's been done to that egg or that uh, icon or that that third generation maybe of a, you know, Pole or a Russian or another, they see the beauty and they're, they're finding and feeling a lack, I think, in the American culture. Mm -hmm. So many people go, when I tell them what we do for Easter, what we do for Christmas, and they're like, we don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? It's so hard for me to fathom that, that they're behind a TV and maybe eating a TV dinner or, or just throwing a lasagna in the oven. Yeah. Well, I think, too, if you could do your eggs on TikTok, maybe that might make it famous again. <laughs> you know what? I need someone to help me with that, uh, that yeah. uh, computer stuff, all that electronics. I, I would rather be out there making, doing, yeah. creating. Yeah. But I think, too, like you said, there's so much about not only are we losing the masters, yep. um, they're so rooted in those villages. And I remember when I was in Russia, you know, seeing just second day we were there, like the Matryoshkas in the market and all that. And everybody's like, no, we'll take you to the village. We'll take you, you know, yeah. they're hand carved. They're not, I mean, just the difference and the, the respect of it, that, that they know the difference in that community and how do we relate that in modern day Minnesota. And I think that's the beauty of, you know, Festival of Nations and Powderhorn Art Fair and all that. But that's two days. That's two days a year. Right. It's interesting you said that about Russia because that's a good thing that you, um, an important kind of idea or thought that you, you, you just mentioned or spoke very clearly. There is folk art. There is art that is produced for the masses. It's yeah. kind of they're making it almost like a factory. Yep. But there is that person in the village who is still doing true. You know, they're weaving the basket, they're dying, they're doing the real folk art. Yeah. Because I know like in Russia, Poland, they did have the tourist art, you know, for the tourists selling the cheap yep. bag. But there is those people who are still doing it the old beautiful way. And you can feel it when you walk into their house into the, it is amazing what you feel what you see and what you come out it's such a blessing to connect with them well and i think in any creative space you know like i can just be having a bad day and i i never like to get anywhere late or but you know those moments where you just like things aren't on your side like like yesterday like yesterday yeah. but you know I'm when you approach your easel or your chopping board or whatever it is there's a reverence that something 
switches off and something switches on to say, now is my time to create. And it doesn't matter whether it's the meal to nourish you or something that nourishes your soul. Everybody has that. And I think that it goes back to that. Even those people that say like, oh, I'm not creative. Well, no, it's you're not using it. Right. You know, and, and that's what it's about. It's about using your creativity and getting turned on. Like you can get turned on cooking your meal at night. Exactly. You know what? It's making it a part of your life and making sure it is important. My kids, when they're younger, they always said to me, Dad, not everything has to be artsy. And I said, oh, yes, it does. Yeah. So important from how you cook it. Even when you're cooking, your feelings are kind of, I remember the movie Chocolat mm -hmm. and what an impression that made or Babette's Feast. Yeah. And bringing that love into the food, that is the same thing, whatever you do, bringing that in from putting up and using real linen. Get rid of the paper, the paper yep. napkin, linen, use china, use real pottery, you know, things that are created with your hands, not the mass produced stuff. Well, and I think part of that goes back to, you know, we talked about the sacred and the sacred moving through you, but having those rituals, there's a ritual to it. You know, like, and I think people don't even, um, don't even associate what a ritual is. I mean, even shaving in the morning is a ritual or, you know, I learned I've perfected my iced coffee over the pandemic. Um, but there is something about, I bought a special ice cube tray and I use my same mug every day. I mean, there is that moment of let the world stop. I'm making my coffee. Oh, I have to share something with you. You will love this. This is something I smuggled out of Russia oh. in 79. And I slow myself down. I show people this. I'm going to show you this. It's a rush, a true Russian samovar. I knew and it. Yep. Oh. I do make tea out of this. And yeah. it is not electric. Yep. It's you a use truly, it still? Pardon? You use it now? Oh, gosh, yes. And I had used it on parties and my nephews and nieces and the Polish community when I do it or like uh, when I we had the Christmas party for the iconography group in Northeast, I will bring that and make tea and make the true tea with the incensia and the water. And the smell is so much, the taste of the chai, the tea is so different when it's made out of, in, out of a true samovar. Yeah. Uh, do you know Suze Ellickson? Yes. Yeah, yep. and, list, and readers know her well. Um, she has a samovar that was her grandmother's. Oh, and wow. it's, it's, yeah, and I think there's so much, yeah, they're amazing devices. And do you have the, I remember in Russia, the glasses with the silver yep. sleeve, well, yeah. Of course I do. I know, why did I even ask? I've got a whole different set here. Look at this. Yeah, look at that. Yep. And I even had the true brick from 1979 that I smuggled out of Russia. At that time, you couldn't. The food was horrific. We were drinking beer for breakfast and cold potatoes and clotted milk. There was nothing at that time with communism. But I bought, and I have it to this day, and I could show, it's incredible, this huge block of tea that could kill you. You have to chip it with a hammer, oh, and it has a beautiful imprint on it. And you put a little bit of that with water from the samovar. I have that. I haven't chipped it. I still have it in yeah. my collection here. Yeah. I remember um, in Russia, yep. so the train that we took from Moscow to uh, Azhevsk is where I studied, sure. was called the Chloroform Express. And like this, I went for the State Department of the US and they said like, you have to take your door shut, you have to do all this stuff. But I was with a British lady and she was like, untape everything, it's tea time. And how they did the tea service on the train. And I was yep. one of those, like, just show me how you make the tea. And so, you yep. know, going to see how they drew that water off the coal in the train yep. and still oh, yeah. had the samovar and the beauty of it. And then we had our tea and taped our door back up so they couldn't chloroform us. And away we went into Siberia. Wow. You would love this story. I was going in at, uh, from Russia into Poland. And it was on the 
west on the eastern border in Poland, way up north. And we were taking the train and at Yeah. Kind of lag there. Um, no, oh, they raised the train up, all the compartments, because what they did is the railroad tracks were a different size going from Russia to Poland. And they did that so the German army wouldn't come in. So when you would have to cross the border, the whole train is up in the air. And then we had the Russian soldiers with the machine guns and the German shepherds policing outside so no one would leave the train. We're up in the air. You could see that. There are little old ladies changing the wheels on the train cars. There are police, the Russian um, soldiers standing at our compartment, making sure no one's trying to leave illegally. They strip out our whole compartment to make sure no one's in the seats or a hiding anywhere. It yeah. was unbelievable. And the spotlights and the machine guns and the barbed wire, but going up in the air. And, wow. And, yeah, and uh, the experiences that I've done, uh, because the first time I was in, in Russia, it was still very communistic. Our rooms were bugged by the KGB. So oh. we fed them information, false information, oh. and we called in a couple of times. But the second time when I just went in 2016, holy cow, people were not afraid to talk. I was talking in Polish and, you know, Russian is a, is a Slavic language. So I could talk to them and every fifth word, we would understand each other. We could ha I could have a conversation. Plus I learned Cyrillic. And so I was amazed at people were not afraid to talk. We talked about everything from Stalin to Lenin to to Trump and you know it was refreshing because the stories I could tell you back then but now there's traffic jams there are cars when I was there last it was horses and wagons and it was winter time and we took a troika in yeah. the winter time when I um I was there in 96 and it was still like they took your passport when you got off the floor at your hotel and there was yep. that little hall between each room where you knew they were like in the little listing and yep. it was crazy. My two other favorite Russia stories are, I went to the Chekhov library yep. and she said to me, um, here, you want to see Chekhov's uh, centimeter for centimeter? And I said, what is that? She said, oh, it's his translation, Shakespeare, centimeter for centimeter. And I was like, would that be major for major? <laughs> yeah. And just handed me this this handwritten copy. Like they never had that sense of because it was so much of their culture, they never preserved it. I mean, you know, if it was here, we'd have it under glass and you'd turn with tweezers. And in the we were in the Hermitage and we were in the basement and there oh. were Fabergé eggs. Yep. And she said to me, uh, every year it's it floods down here. And yep. so I said to my little thing, I said, well, what do they do with the eggs? And she looked at me, she said, they float. And I thought like, <laughs> seriously? Like she was just so matter of fact, like if we don't think to move it, it floods down here every year. Right, yep. And yep. I just think that that's that same, whether it's done by a master or it's done by a master in a village, it's what they've always known. So there isn't always a price to it. Would you agree with that? Yes, it has changed now. When now, when I went to the Hermitage and some of these other places, I was blown away. They are starting to develop and you're seeing the true icons and the art. What Good. I wanted to see was the Amber Room. And last time I went, they finished it and it was open. So I got to see the Amber Room. Beautiful. But the history of the Amber Room is fascinating. And it, it's a huge mystery to this day. Now, um, did you see Lenin when you were there? Yeah, oh, I have a story. So this is in 1976. It is February. And it is the terrible, terrible winds, the cold, horrible um, from Siberia blowing in. 
and we decided we wanted to see Lenin in the Red Square. We had to stand in line outside in that horrible cold. It's February. And there are Russian police and soldiers policing us as we're standing and with dogs and the machine guns. And you feel like you're a victim. And, you, and there is this reverence. There is no talking, no wisdom. You stand in line and you're, you're not allowed to talk, nothing. And I have seen people being pulled out of that line and taken out because there is that reverence for Lenin. So as you get closer to the Red Square, to the building, to the mausoleum, they make you take your hat off. And it is so cold and you go down and then up and around and you're up on, and you see all these incredible murals that are hand painted. And right down there is the, uh, the crystal casket with Lenin laying down in it. And you only, they tell you to go in and, you know, they check, there's no bags allowed, no nothing, yeah. so no bombs. They, you know, Lenin was their God. And at that time, when I was there, there was a newlywed, it was February. They came to pray in front of his ma a mausoleum and they put flowers down yeah. before they went to get married. I, I remember just thinking like, yeah, and me, it was hard to shut me up. <laughs> but I remember like, they just kept saying, do not talk, do not talk, do not right. talk. And you swing around that corner and just like, boom, there he was. But you know what? My bubble was burnt, was kind of broken when I learned many years later, National Geographic did an article saying that there are numerous Lenins. I'm sure. They switch them out because someone could come in there, bomb it, and their God would be gone. And they switch his clothes all up. Because right. I said to my, my, my okay. diplomat, I said, like, that's a pretty modern suit he's got on. And she's like, we change his clothes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that was the true, real Lenin there. You know, they have people believing that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's that reverence. So we have covered it all today, my friend. I know. Um, so you are you have Easter in a month, right? I'm sorry? Is your Easter this weekend or you do the one in a month? No, it's Sunday. Oh. It is I get Sunday. two Easter's with Michael. I get the, right, the Christian the Orthodox. one and the Orthodox one. Right, right, right. So, yes. So we're busy baking the babkas and doing the eggs and doing, it is an incredible, incredible time because for us, it's the most holy time. And our big thing is tomorrow going to the Polish church and you'll see the, the, ble the baskets being blessed. Yeah. Because they'll bring in, in our basket. We're not allowed to cook. So whatever you have in your basket, you're using for Yelkanots, which is Easter in Polish. And so everything has a meaning from the, the ham, the Polish sausage, chvikwa, which is beets with horseradish. You make a butter lamb with the you know, clove uh, eyes. You've got salt, pepper. You've got hard boiled eggs that are co uh, one color. And we always uh, shine them up with goose fat. And then you had the pisanki, the colored eggs. You always mm -hmm. had something green in there. So there was something from the forest, from the field. Everything had a meaning. And you had rye bread in there, the, the babka, the uh, Easter bread. And it was covered in a cloth. And you'd bring it to the Polish church to get blessed. So that will be on Saturday. And there are literally thousands of baskets. And the priest goes and blesses them. And the kids are there. And it's pretty cool. So then in a Polish family, you usually go to Resurrection Mass, which starts usually at like 5.30 in the morning and goes yeah. hours. And it's the tradition and all that. But in a Polish family, when you go, the greeting is Christus Zmartwychwstał. And the greeting and the return is Prawdziwie Zmartwychwstał. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Whenever you go into a Polish family house and then you break the uh, hard-boiled egg as a symbol of, of life with salt and pepper that was blessed from your basket. And me being the oldest in my family now, in my household, you take the palm from Palm Sunday and the holy water and you bless everybody with that palm. Yeah. And then we have the breakfast meal. And depending on what part of Poland you're from, 
there are different traditions. My dad was from the Lublin area. So everything, this is interesting and you need to try this. And it sounds gross. Americans don't understand, but when I've given it, they go, this is good. Uh, you cut up everything and you put it in a soup. We make what's called a biawi barsh, a white beet soup, barsh. It's not really uh, beet soup. You make a concoction that ferments for two weeks in the sun or on your radiator out of oats and uh, flour and garlic and all this stuff. That's kind of the base of the soup. It is incredible. And then you chop up everything and put it in that uh, in that soup. Wow. Some people will have red barish, the clear barish. Some will have just the big Easter hams and the Polish sausage and the eggs. It, a Polish table is just incredible. And then we have a special drink that you have to marry into the family to get the recipe. There's a hex on it and we're not allowed to give, give it out. So we make it only at Easter time, Christmas or weddings. And it's called Krupnik. But okay. Krupnik, you have to be careful, is also barley soup. So when you look it up, so you're not looking up for barley soup, but you're looking for the hooch. Um, and it warms your belly. And everybody toasts in the Polish family when you do the egg and, and the greeting, you drink, you, everybody has a, 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 a shot of Krupnik. And uh, everybody has, uh, every Polish household has like 20 some shot glasses, crystal ones. And they also have Vishniupka, which is uh, cherry vodka. And that's incredible. I've got a Renaissance recipe that I make and I have two cherry trees now, so I make my own and it is incredible. So you have that and then you, you sit and feast and feast. And the first day is usually only with family. In Poland, Easter is actually three days. Okay. It's with your family. The second day is with outside family. And the third day is with your friends. But Monday is an incredible day. And it is celebrated still in Poland. It's called Smingus Dingus or Mokrego uh, Panijawek, Wet Monday. Because, and you will see this, Buckets of ice water are thrown on you. It's the, the, uh, the symbol of spring, of renewal. And you will see this. If you're out in a village in Poland, you will get a bucket of ice water from the well. Or if you're walking in an old town and they've got the balconies out, you will get wet. In, wow. To this day. I remember living in Poland the first year. My landlord snuck into my room, opened up all the windows all my balcony was, so it was icy cold in my room. And he took him, he went to outside to the well and got water and doused me with a bucket of water. And I had some choice words for him that weren't kind in, in English. And yeah. he thought that was hysterical. That was my smingus dingus, but it's still done wow. in Poland. Well, Thank you for everything. Enjoy your Easter. I hope somebody throws a bucket of ice water on you on Monday. No, I do that to them. They always forget. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I'm going to close out our, our chat today, and I hope to see you soon. Can I, before we leave, can I just give a greeting in, in Eastern Polish? Please, Please do. Have... Okay. Vita moi drodzy. Wkrótce będziemy celebrować Wielkanoc. To będzie zmartwychwstanie Pana Jezusa. Życie Wam spokoju, radości, miłości i mokrego dingusa. Witam. Cześć. Dziękuję. There you go. Happy Easter, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you for joining us today. You can read the digital edition of Minnesota Monthly at minnesotamonthly.com. Grill Fest tickets are on sale. I'd like to thank iBobs, where they make your life every bit as interesting as your eyewear. Until I see you next weekend, make something, be safe, be kind, enjoy Easter, and get out and enjoy spring. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.